Hello, everybody. My name is Eric Hines. I'm curator of film at Museum of the Moving Image in Queens. I'm reporting to you now, however, from Brooklyn. Um, this is part of our ongoing, um, you know, a view from home series uh, of events and screenings um, and discussions as part of what we're doing here at Museum of the Moving Image over the next uh, or over these over these weeks and months, um, hopefully not for too much longer. Um, but um, we have found that uh, these online events are a really crucial way of remaining connected to you all at home and to um, actually engage artists who are also in the same position that we're in. And we have an opportunity to gather together um, over really fantastic uh, works of cinema and visual art. Um, uh, for this discussion, uh, this is for the Feast of the Epiphany virtual cinema release. Uh, Feast of the Epiphany opened in a virtual cinema release on Friday. Um, and it is the further extension of the, the rollout of Feast of the Epiphany that began with its uh, world premiere at BAM Cinema Fest at our friends BAM, uh, Brooklyn Academy of Music. Um, it, it then made its way having a festival tour um, and then we opened the film uh, theatrically at the end of last year uh, and had an amazing uh, run of the film uh, and fantastic reviews um, and then made its way into some other theaters throughout the country. And now um, it appears virtually uh, Thanks to the filmmakers for bringing it to us, the museum. Uh, they are really offering it uh, as, uh, as an incredible gesture of support for us as a museum. The funds for this are going to help us uh, remain uh, doing events like this and to pay for staffing uh, during this tough time. Uh, and so we thank them for that. And we thank any of you who have been giving um, money during this time for us to continue to do these events. And particularly if you gave any money to, uh, for, for this particular one. Um, I want to uh, again thank our filmmakers and our cast and crew for being here. We have a, a, an incredible gathering uh, to, to bring to you uh, visually um, over the next uh, bit of time. But I want to first bring out um, the filmmakers, Michael Koreski, um, uh, Free Hazaman and Jeff Reichert. Um, they are Jeff Reichert and, and Michael Koreski are the editors and founders of, of Reverse Shot. Um, and this is a Reverse Shot production um, and, uh, and a, uh, Friha and Jeff are longtime filmmaking partners, so it's two partnerships brought together um, in a very unique film that I can't wait to talk about with them right now. So bear with me as I bring them back into the room. Hey, Eric. Hey, Michael. Hello. Sure. Hey, we've, been, we've been reappeared. You've been reappeared. Well, well you no, know, you're the, it's the first time anybody at home has seen you. Sure. Um, <laughs> Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you all for bringing us the film yet again. Um, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous film. Um, and uh, I think uh, a film that only the three of you people could have possibly made. Um, there's something very personal about it while also being incredibly generous. Um, and I think it's a really beautiful film to gather around right now um, when we're also remote from one another. Um, so to, uh, for a film that's really about a sense of chosen family, this is a really meaningful film for me and I think for a lot of people to, to, come, to encounter right now. Um, you've heard this a million times or you've said this a million times, if you don't mind uh, beginning a little bit to talk about how the collaboration that you've all, that you've had, the three of you had in various forms over the years led to collaborating around, around this film. I know it's, it's a long story and you've been working on it for a long time, or at least you started working on it a long time ago. So if you don't mind sort of starting us off that way. Um, should, should I start? I don't know. Should I? I think, I think we can start. Um, so this, yeah, as you say, Eric, it's been a long gestating project. And I think that it went through a lot of stages. The first stage was really the completely conceptual one, which is that I would say like eight years ago at this point, eight or nine years ago, we can't remember the exact beginning date. We were kind of wandering around the farmer's market <laughs> and we actually thought to ourselves, it'd be really fascinating to make a film in which in the most, I'm going to put this in the most kind of literal way imaginable, because I don't think, we don't think the film is a literal film, but in the most literal way imaginable, what if you had a film that was half documentary, half fiction, and those two halves were very discreet and very clear, and there was no question about when you were watching the documentary and when you were watching the fictional film, and that the documentary would be about a farm, and that the fictional film would be about a dinner, and inherently, you know, your mind would go to where does this food come from? And then you would transition from the dinner into the documentary part, from a scripted film with characters into, uh, you know, I'm gonna say real, because if that's a term we kind of want to deconstruct into the real part where you see where the food came from. And then um, 
you know, it went, we'll take it from there, but I, I'll, I'll also let one of my co-filmmakers take it from there. Yeah, no, we, we were curious to see how it might work. And the, the, I think the moment when we were thinking of um, this concept, it was a moment in, especially in documentary film, where people were talking a lot about hybridity and hybrid forms and movies in which you are, you are being asked to negotiate minute by minute your relationship to ideas like um, fiction, reality, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas in this, we thought, well, what if you didn't have to negotiate? What, if, what are the implications of splitting those things apart, but still putting them in the same container and thinking about what are the, the kind of narrative and emotional ramifications of that. It's kind of like the next, and I think probably the longest part of the gestation was figuring out how to like take this, this idea and, and kind of populate it with things that felt, um, felt like things we'd want to make a movie about. Mm -hmm. And to be clear, the sense of risk and frankly uncertainty at times at how the film would hang together uh, pervaded the process. Like we felt very, um, strongly and emotionally about the experience but even sitting in the edit room the feeling of how does this work as an emotional arc as opposed to sort of two separate narrative journeys was a real guiding question and a source of I want to say like thrilling uncertainty um, and I I think that we often like for Michael to begin answering the question about how the film originated because he's also the screenwriter of the scripted portion um, and while the, the concept and then the content evolved over time, as films always do in the writing process and the editing process, in this case, it also became fused with a lot of personal experiences that we had had in that period of time. So it wasn't just, you know, the, ver the very important tenet of like, where does, your, where does the food come from? And how do we sort of explore um, these like ways of gathering and trying to connect? It went to a new place when we, um, experienced some losses in our own families um, and among friends that then sort of connected this idea of um, of life cycles and and seasonal cycles and it 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 took so much time in part because it feels like the project was waiting to be infused with some more from our lives. Right. I mean, by the time I'm sorry, Eric, if you wanted to. Um, by the time it, you know, I started to actually sit down and write it, my life had changed pretty considerably. Um, and Fariha's life had changed very, pretty considerably. And you know, without going into too much detail, we both experienced losses of parents that were um, difficult in extremely different ways. And the screenplay became about that. The screenplay itself, which would be one half of this overall experience, um, it became a way to express a very particular kind of grief and the, uh, how we were dealing with the grieving process. And one of the things that we were dealing with at the time was how do we actually, that we were dealing with, I would say, in an unspoken way, because we didn't know how to talk about these things, because um, we only were able to talk about them later, actually, after the film was finished, I would say, was um, how do we connect through this shared sense of tragedy when the things that we're feeling are so incredibly different. Like the, just the way that our parents died were extremely different. We wanted to connect to each other. We, we wanted to be close to each other, but we felt distant. And that's what's happening with the characters in the first half of the film. There's a distance between them, but there's a need, there's a constant need to reach out. And, and I also thought it would be very interesting to make a movie about people who are trying to be uh, good to each other and trying to be kind and who felt um, like they somehow couldn't be. And that's actually much more interesting and tragic than you know, a movie about an, an asshole. <laughs> asshole, <laughs> asshole in Brooklyn, it just means everybody. Which, which is somewhat related to the thing that I, was, I wanted to follow up with, which is like once, once the, the, the germination is what it is and then what happened in your lives became what that is and then that affects one, affects the other. And I'm curious um, the ways in which film, which, excuse me, the ways in which food and eating felt even more appropriate or ways in which it didn't. Like, I mean, there, there's, there's ways in which if you were to go through the front door in terms of some of the things you were dealing with, you may have told a different story, but the fact that you had this one to go to, to return to, why was it, why was it the right, you know, why was that this material the right, the right material for, for processing some of that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that, that's, a, that's a really good point. I've never really thought about it quite in that way. I mean, dinner is such a, it's kind of like an elemental thing in a certain way. You're bringing people together for certain reasons. Everybody has different intentionality, has different relationships. Things are said, things are not said. And it seemed like, you know, with a dinner, you, in, a, in a movie, you can populate it with almost anything if you want to. 
Um, and having that, you know, having the dinner and having the idea of where the food came from sort of opened it up to a certain extent. And then there's the, you know, coming back to what Freya said about kind of life cycles and seasons, like we had never intended to shoot on the farm for as long as we did. We thought we would just shoot winter in New York and spring on the farm until the, you know, the folks at the farm, Jody and company um, said, well, you've only been here for five days in May. You haven't seen anything yet. You should come back in the spring or in the summer when we're, when we're actually doing stuff. And so we did, and then we kept coming back. And so it became a movie that takes place over the course of a whole year. And that was also something that wasn't necessarily intended from the conception. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I know that uh, Jeff and Freeha, you worked on that second half and were filming that, but Michael, you, know, you wrote the script for the first half and obviously the three of you were there present for, the first, for, the, for that shoot. And I'm curious about that bleed from one to the other. And, and Michael, like if, if, if going to this very completely different setting, which was not necessarily defined by what you had written in the first place, if you felt evidence of what, uh, or if you felt spiritually or connected to, to, to that second uh, part of it when you, you know, when you visited and, and also for the two of you in filming it. Well, I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll, since you asked, I'll briefly say it, but I'd also want to kick it over to Freeha specifically because, for this question, because I think we feel very similarly about this, is, is that, as I was saying before, the, in a movie about grieving and in a movie in which you kind of put your ideas about grieving into it and try to translate it into some sort of art, you never feel like there's necessarily any closure. And there is no closure with grieving, right? Um, it comes back, it'll keep coming back forever in ways that you least expect. Um, so one of the unexpected things was that the, the second half of the film, the, which we always envisioned as a documentary on a farm where you see the food, but we didn't know at first what, which farm it would be, what it would look like, what it would feel like. By the time it was actually composed, um, it felt like this complete cathartic narrative. And, and I realized this is actually a perfect metaphor of how I deal with my grieving. Like this is, it's, it's, it's about these tightly contained people who don't have catharsis, who don't have any release. And then when you get to the farm and you have these people working together on this other kind of community, and when it's in this open air, and when um, they're, they have a different kind of set of problems, you, I felt that um, suddenly I had, I had release and it was like a spiritual kind of release. Yeah. Um, I did, I did um, feel both a shift and a continuity, which I think was very satisfying um, in moving to that portion of the film. And even though Jeff and I had made many documentaries together before, and there's, there's certain ways of working and things that we're comfortable with, A, having a whole different team, having Michael in the mix uh, was a change um, that was really exciting. Um, but also we had never made a documentary that was part of this larger film that we had already shot. So we did shoot, you know, obviously the narrative had been written and was filmed before we ever even started looking for the farm. Um, and that uh, carrying over into the entire experience of, well, you know, what are the kinds of things that we're looking for? I, I feel like we had, and we talked about it at the time, we were very aware of this, a really heightened um, kind of um, um, awareness and connectedness with the space because we started seeing these rhymes from what we had filmed earlier, things like the uh, very simple things, because that's what the film is about, where uh, on the farm that we filmed on, which is called Roxbury Farms, um, and we do have someone here who can speak to that a little bit more later, um, they gather every day for lunch. That's the time when they, when they sit down and eat a meal, and it is a really important part of the cycle. They uh, are engaging with these, um, uh, these kind of routines and, and, and cycles that um, mirror some of what the characters in the written portion are, are dealing with and how they live. Um, so I think that the, the order kind of opened my eyes in ways that I hadn't been able to experience coming in with such a, such a sense of like, what are the kinds of experiences and images that we're looking for? Even something as simple as, you know, someone may, chopped up this kale and now I'm watching it grow out of the earth. Like I felt a renewed sense of um, um, excitement and connection with those those small uh, resonances. Mm -hmm. Well, I think let's start bringing some friends in. So we've got uh, <laughs> Jody, Nikki, and Jesse. Let's start with them. Hey. <laughs> Hi. 
so good to see you all. <laughs> So, so Nikki and Jesse were in the first part, were cast uh, for that. And I'd love to know about the process of casting uh, the two of them and your experiences and what you, what you understood of this film. And it's an incredibly unique film. There's really no film in the history of cinema quite like this. Um, and then Jody, of course, uh, we see you in your farm in the second half of the film. And um, I've never got a chance to speak to you before. I've done a few Q and A's for this film and never got a chance to speak to you, which is exciting for me. Um, so, um, could we, and I don't know if the filmmakers want to sort of bring us into the, the sort of stages of encountering folks. Does that help? Um, sure, I'll just, yeah, just very briefly, we, had, we also had a great, a great casting director who's also we call our dramaturg, her name is Shawnee Enelo, um, who's also a brilliant writer and a professor at Fordham. And she just has access to all these wonderful actors mostly from the experimental theater world. And she just started um, setting up auditions for us. She says, I, I can think of wonderful people. She read, as Shani read the script, I can think of great people who would be good for these roles. So she, we auditioned a bunch of people and that's how we met Nikki and Jesse. And we were very excited to meet them. That's all I'll say. And I'm really curious to hear um, from your perspective, Jody, what it was like to have these people just show up <laughs> and be like, can we please spend a lot of time with you on your farm where you work very hard every day? Um, but, you know, like, honestly, there were things uh, in, in searching for a farm, like we were, we were looking for a particular feeling. And I do think that Roxbury Farms is super special. Um, for one thing, it's um, run by Jody and her sister. Um, and like they speak to that in the film a little bit about being women who run a farm and breaking into that space. And that's something that again, had some, some mirrored qualities in the first half where we're really um, looking a lot at um, sort of female uh, experience uh, and the way in which you gathered every morning, Jody, and did the sort of Steiner prayer to set, set the day, like that, that retroactively became in all of our minds, what the film was about. And we couldn't mm -hmm. have guessed that. And that is something that we didn't totally know when we started filming with you. We just kind of ha had a particular feeling and connection with you and your crew. Um, and then every day, something like that would happen. And we we're like, I, I didn't know that, that this <laughs> is part of their whole philosophy of, of farming and growing food. And it's so, such a good fit for how we think about the film also. So where should we where should we start? <laughs> uh, well, let, 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 maybe let's just start chronologically a little bit. Um, and and uh, Nikki and Jesse, that obviously you, you encounter a film like this that is unique and it's uniquely structured. But you're cast to play characters in the first half of of what's conceived. But there's also an element, as we see from the very beginning of the film, of documentary within your segments. That and I and I'm, I'm curious about is that something you were familiar with from the beginning that sort of develop over the course of, over the course of 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 of, of the beginning of the shoot, Either those were basically casting scenes, or were they, yeah, and, and whether you knew that might be in the film, is that something that came to you later, that possibility? I think that was quite unexpected, because we had gotten, we had been asked for permission after all the filming had happened, so for me that was a little, that was, um, I didn't, we are, we didn't film that first part thinking that it would be part of the um, whole film. And I think it really slides in there, like folks' expectations or whatever they think, or what I thought I was going to be a part of, yeah. which is like another, it's yet another flip, mini flip, like right from the beginning. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's also that, like, as a performer, predominantly a theater performer, which a lot of the cast was, I think, in the mm -hmm. first part, it's really interesting because the idea of, like, playing to the camera, like, is not something I'm super trained in or aware of. And, like, especially during that first interview part, who, I didn't know what they were filming, what they weren't, you know, if they were just trying to see what I looked like on camera, whatever. So like to, yeah, to see those, those parts later and see myself in sort of like a public, but very private dialogue. And then to go into what was more performative because I was playing a character, you know, like it, it, for one thing, it's really interesting because I don't think I've ever been in a documentary of any kind. And so to see that snapshot of, my life at that point because a lot again a lot has changed since then mm -hmm. and and so to see that person there and then see the character that was played and then likewise after seeing the whole thing 
learning a lot and realizing a lot in how it was framed and just stuff that has sunk in later. Lots I've experienced like it's it, the whole journey that life cycle is very true for me as well from the whole process. Well, there's there's a way in which those uh, I, I really I love how that functions in the in the beginning of the film um, because it really does. Um, it, it, it just personalizes things in a significant way. And, and it puts a lot, I think, on the performers that, that, that it's, you're being utilized in, in, that, in that way, that these sort of, sort of candid, captured uh, uh, moments wind up being really part of it. But I think that, as you said, Nikki sort of sliding into the, 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 the narrative of it is really beautiful because in a way it, it does something to the audience, or at least for me as an audience member, where I'm, I'm allowed to see this as performance. I'm allowed to see this as a drama, but it's a drama that emerges from, from people in the real world. Mm -hmm. we, wanted, we wanted the audience to, I don't mean to speak, sometimes we do the royal we, and I'm like, oh, I hope that everything I say, Jeff, <laughs> but I believe that we wanted the audience to realize from the very beginning it was a constructed world. So if you see, the, if you get the sense these people are, are rehearsing for part, as soon as the actual film starts, you think this is a constructed world, and to heighten that constructed world makes the, the documentary part all the more, um, you know, um, you become more aware of the documentary part in opposition to the constructed world. And so we wanted people to constantly think about negotiating those registers. And there's part of that that was very, again, thought through, discussed, debated amongst us, but it's been interesting hearing more recently from um, Nikki and Jesse about the process on their end and thinking about the ways in which the fact that we even had that material to work with it comes from our instincts as people who work have worked primarily in documentary slash are like moving between these spaces so you know jesse in a in another q a you said to me nobody's asked me these questions about my personal life in an audition before <laughs> and i was like i can't believe i had hadn't even considered that of course a, a human being is in front of me i have questions about, about their life and it just seems so natural for us um to make that the audition process not having in mind at that time that we would use it as a way to kind of um, anchor what their characters would be that it, it then fed into a little bit of rewriting with the characters or, or just little details like the um the recipes that nikki cooks and the scripted portion are coming from you know things that she talked about being comfort foods or, or culturally specific foods for her but you know it's it started from we just set up a process for a thing that we were relatively new to in a way that made sense to us but actually was was pretty unusual i've discovered I mean, since we're speaking a little bit of the first half, I am actually going to bring in the other two guests for the for for the portion, and we'll we'll make our way through some of the things we're bringing up. But we've got Ashley Connor and Caitlin May Burke here as well, who've been wonderfully patient in the shadows. <laughs> and Caitlin Hi. is uh, our our producer, and Ashley Connor she was the the ace DP of the the first half of the film. And and I wanted to, if you don't mind. Um, uh, uh, Ashley, there's, there's a way, and because I was going to ask us of the actors, and I wouldn't mind to have you be part of this if you have any thoughts on this, which is because um, when, we, when we slide from the, uh, the, the candid uh, audition moments into the narrative part, there's nothing, as you said from the very beginning, the concept was never to have the narrative portion be mistaken for a documentary in any way. There's a way in which it's a little bit heightened. It's a little bit, you know, highly dramatized. And also I think the way that it's shot as well. Um, there's something uh, in, in terms of the lighting, in terms of the lighting style in, in, in general. Again, this is not a documentary. Um, and, and I'd love to know about the decisions about how to actually, um, uh, exactly what look to give it and also to actually how to work through performance. Um, so that again, you're not, it's not naturalistic in a strict sense. Doesn't mean that anyone's unnatural, but it's not naturalistic. Well, I think, I hope I'm not uh, giving away production secrets, but we <laughs> shot about 35 to 40 pages in two days. <laughs> uh, so that was in itself, you know, a limitation and a challenge that I think everybody kind of rose to, but, um, you know, they shared with me, I think, Michael's favorite film, maybe I'm speaking out of term, but uh, the Terrence Davies, The Long Day Closes. And so that was like a really good 
reference point for the sort of stylistic departures that you can take within the, the narrative form and sort of speak to melodrama while having it be quite grounded. So, you know, the actors were so on point with their performances. We're doing like huge, like, I just remember the dinner table scene, we're doing huge scenes of just people performing and every single take they're doing it so well and it's very long takes. Um, but in my mind, it was so wonderful because, you know, Michael, Jeff and Faria were very encouraging of just like, let's just keep going for it. Let's, uh, you know, if we're gonna do a dolly shot that continues around the table and, you know, we're shooting on a DSLR, um, very low budget and they had a very small team but it was very much you know tapping into whatever what all the performers were giving us which was so nice and to me i love melodrama in a way because i think it opens doors for lighting it opens doors for um to kind of engage with naturalism in a new form and so it was a really fun place to play and also like we said we shot many, many pages over two days. <laughs> um, but that to me, it was like, it wasn't scary because I felt like everyone was speaking the same language, everyone was on the same page and we just kind of went for it. One of my favorite things about the shoot, and I always, I always love this about working with you, Ashley, is that like we would, we would like be in the, like waiting to set up some like ridiculous dolly shot or some very long scene or Michael and Freya would be downstairs like working with the actors and going over and, and working with the performances. And we would just be like looking around and stuff and be like, that's kind of cool. And I'd be like, Ashley, could you get a shot of that? And you'd be like, yeah, I'll get a shot of these shoes. And then you'd be like, oh, I see this too. I like that. And then I like this and I like this. And all of a sudden, these things that weren't scripted, that weren't things that we necessarily felt that we had to collect, there are so much of that is in the movie. And I also wanted to say, like, what you're talking about, Ashley, is something that we talk about all the time, which is that you showed up with your team and, and you were like, wait, how many pages do you want to do today? And we were just like, I don't know, 20? And she was like, wait a second. And then you kind of like had to set us down and school us a little bit. But what made it really work is Jesse and Nikki and the actors were so on point. I mean, having professional theater actors working on this script made the whole thing different. It was just like every take, they had the whole thing down pat. It was... Well, I'd love to follow up on that because this idea of how many pages you were going to be reading at a time, was this something that didn't feel too onerous because of your theater background experience? You're, you're used to sort of running through to that degree or was it actually, you know, not that it's not always a challenge, but I'm curious about um, how, uh, what that felt in those days. I, I think like in that dinner sequence, that was the only scene I was in aside from one other small thing. So that was like my, most of my experience on set and there was so much tension of various kinds. And I think that's, there's so much depth to that, that even in our own lives, like, you know, we see, we make eye contact with someone and we see them again and it's different, you know, and that's the thing with theater too, it's different every time. So I think each time we got to try it as in theater, like we got to keep playing with it and finding new stuff for ourselves while maintaining the consistency of the scene and I remember all the wine glasses having to be refilled and everything you know made just right which like bless all the peeps who had their eye on that um but yeah I mean it is definitely something like that in rehearsals that's that's in theater in particular it's like keep playing there are no closed doors like keep figuring out and especially because I think some of us had worked together a lot others not so much so like we're also getting to know each other within the confines of, of the relationships of the scene itself. So yeah, it, it, it's always interesting. I'm always endlessly curious um, about what we can find. And Caitlin, you've been, um, you got the mute. <laughs> uh, you've worked on documentaries, you've worked on television, you worked on narrative films. What, was, what, were, what were these days like for you? Like what were the particular challenge? I mean, were there challenges like, was this familiar, could you call on some previous experience for this or did this have an entirely new set of, cha set of challenges? I mean, I'll, I'll let the directors answer this, but I think that that's sort of why I was brought on, um, that I have done a lot of work at this scale in all of these different spaces. Uh, so it's like, I am the documentary fr friend who knows how to like fill out SAG paperwork. Mm -hmm. And so that, um, <laughs> I think that it's really beautiful. I think that it's nice to see how all of the, but I like in my heart, I'm a documentary person. 
which, and I have offended a lot of uh, narrative uh, scripted producers by saying how easy it is. And they get really, really heated. But to me, it's something where like the magic <laughs> happens in front of the camera because you have all of your pieces. Whereas in documentary, you go and you like drive your car into a ditch and then like the cow is giving birth and you have to decide if you're gonna like get the tractor to pull out the car or go get the shot <laughs> and then figure out how you're getting home because you have to like shoot the other thing. And so something of this is like, you just, you put it together and then people create and it breathes and it becomes what it wants to do. And so producing scripted stuff is easier to me in that way. But I think that the way that this was sort of moving fluidly between all of these different spaces, it was like very calming because it was like, it was very unpredictable in a way that is the excitement of uh, non-scripted, non non-fiction stuff. And I literally did drive the car into a ditch. <laughs> <laughs> well, didn't they give yeah. you a Mustang also? So <laughs> completely <laughs> That's when I was there. That was, the, that was my rental car. That was actually a terrifying, <laughs> terrifying weekend. Well, to, 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 to loop back to something what Ashley was saying is I think if you're going to, Caitlin, if you're going to make a, a, a narrative film uh, have the challenges of a documentary, maybe shoot it in two days. <laughs> no. <laughs> Maybe give yourself that immense challenge of doing that in such a short span of time. Well, I think one of, you know, Caitlin talked about how part of what made her such a great fit among many reasons um, for this project, and we're really grateful to have her, was having experience across the board. But I also think it's a kind of openness of thinking that we needed from everybody because moment to moment we're, we weren't you know, nudging each other and saying like, it's fiction now, we're doing fiction stuff now. In the same way that, you know, Jeff referred to these moments with Ashley where like, she has an incredible eye and she responds to the space around her. And we're talking about, you know, what can we work with in this space? And like, th those are some of the images that feel the most, to me, emotionally real, because it's like a photograph or, um, you know, like an unlaced shoe or just these things that like make a space feel real. Or the um, pieces from Nikki's life that became like essential backstory elements yeah. of the character just, just through images, just through photographs. So I think it was a lot also about just like not being so um, tied to, well, what is this piece that we're working on and what does it mean and what does it mean to make a documentary or fiction? Like we're, we're trying to be more responsive to the moment while of course also having to do some of the, the, the challenges of, of scripting and, and trying to prepare actors who have a very short period of time. Um, but yeah, trying to be a little fluid in our understanding of those concepts because that's part of the, um, the mindset behind the film too. It's like, well, what's, what's more real? What feels more real? It's not necessarily always the moments that, that surprised you or happened, um, happened by chance. Mm -hmm. And so, so, so Jeff, you shot most of the second half, most of the documentary footage. Um, how much were you thinking about what Ashley shot for the first half? Could you think about that? Was that relevant? Um, is that something that, um, and, and you obviously weren't mimicking anything, but I'm, I'm just curious what was in your head, what was in your eye, and, and what, you, what was in your eye, but then also maybe what you saw afterwards, and when you're coming together to make the film, um, what sort of rhymes were you seeing, if any? Well, I mean, to be honest, I was terrified because I think prior to that year, I never really thought of myself as somebody who could be a director of photography. And we had hoped Ashley would be able to shoot the farm portion of the film, but we just, you know, it just, it took longer to actually like find a farm that we would like to work with than we, than we actually thought. And Ashley is, you know, is incredibly busy. We were lucky to get her in the first place. And so it came down to like, you know, essentially us and our camera and our crew and going up there. And so I hadn't really watched a lot of the footage when I'm up there, to be honest. And that was partially on purpose. Um, you know, I, obviously, you know, we knew it was going to look amazing. I just, I, I wanted to go in fresh and sort of see, um, you know, to see it kind of anew. Um, and also to try and, I think Faria and I both were trying to shed things that we had done in our previous documentaries. We had better equipment than we'd ever had access to before. Um, we thought this is a real chance to kind of like, you know, experiment and try some things we wouldn't have been able to do in remote area medical or this time next year. And what is so wonderful about filming um, work of any kind, but especially farm work, it's, it's, it's so gorgeous. And there are these repetitions and you can just sort of like linger in the space. 
for a really long time. And that led to a different kind of shooting than we'd ever had the opportunity to. I mean, remote area medical, people are getting treated so fast and so many people are coming through that clinic. You are just constantly battered by new information coming into the frame. Whereas this, it was just a small group of people who we got to know really well over time. And we could just watch them, you know, harvest carrots or corn or whatever it might be that they were getting at that moment. Well, there, there's obviously, you know, like labor constantly taking place on a farm, but the, the labor has a, also has a constant relationship with the land. So we were able to give ourselves permission to spend, you know, there are times when we would really spend all day with Jody and some of the other people who are working on the farm. And then there are times when they'd be like, I don't know where the filmmakers are and we're like off somewhere, you know, kind of trying to get this quality of how the leaf looks different in spring than in <laughs> fall and being able to do that again like actually in a strange way mirrored the um some of the experimentation that we were able to do in the first half even though it was a compressed time frame that that feeling of like well I really want to understand this place and so so Jody can you talk a little bit about what it was like to meet these people and what it was like to let them hang around so much and what you thought of them <laughs> Sure. Uh, so we really didn't have any, we, I assumed we were going to be like a five minute part of this film of a, of a fictional story. I had no idea that the farm would become such a, a part of the film. And it was really like a surprise and an honor um, that, the, that you captured the farm that way. And I, we felt really comfortable around, around Jeff and Faria. Like, as you can probably tell, I think a lot of times we forgot they were there. Because um, we, you, the silly discussions that you captured on film that we often have while doing field work. Um, yeah, we felt so comfortable around them that I think they could, they were able to, you know, become part of the farm for that part of the year when they were there. And Jeff mentioned that uh, conversation at some point about like it, you you thought it was going to be a much shorter shoot, and then, or maybe it was you Fariha, and 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 then there was a notion of like, well, no, you have to sort of be there for a cycle. Um, do you remember that conversation in terms of like getting a sense of what they were going for, but then realizing that they weren't going to get enough of what they should get? Well, like, I, th I think you started filming this time of year, right? In May, mm -hmm. I think. So there, there isn't that much going on yet. Like everything's still sort of coming back to life. So you don't really get all of the action that you get later in the summer when the f everything's alive. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, and it was, well, it was I, I remember like we were there, so we'd come in the spring and then you all said, you haven't seen anything come back. And we're like, all right, why not? And so we came back in the summer. Then the end of that trip, um, I forget who it was, was like, oh, we're starting to prep for our 25th anniversary celebration where we're going to invite all these people to the farm for dinner. <laughs> and so at that point, we, you know, we're sort of like, well, this, this makes a lot of sense, given that the, the other half of the movie ends with the dinner. And by that point, we were sort of like, well, you know, we should come back in fall for just a couple of days. And so I think we're there 25 or 30 days in total, like two, two or three in the fall, mostly in the summer and then four or five in the spring. And the, the script itself is uh, a winter story, not just by chance, very purposefully a winter story. So the original idea had been that when you go to the farm, we, we get to see winter open into spring. And that still happens to a certain extent. And like Michael described, even on an emotional level for, for us and as people, this idea of like, where does, where does the grief go? It, it can't, there's no neat place for it to go, but it opens up into a different kind of space because the world keeps moving and changing. Um, but it just didn't end there. <laughs> it became it became more expansive, and uh, and again, I think like spoke to the the intention better. And that happens with documentary. Con it's like part of what I love about documentary is like being taught I was wrong, <laughs> being taught that my the idea that I had doesn't quite work or isn't quite good enough. And and honestly, it also I, I was so grateful for the time to get to know Jody and your sister Jody and everyone else on the farm a little bit more. I think that, you know, it, it, it always shows in a, um, in a, in a documentary portion, uh, in, a, in one way or the other, something happens that wouldn't have been possible without that relationship. So, uh, there's a question from the audience. Um, and there's also, I just wanted to note, I didn't want to, um, put anybody on the spot visually, but Shani Enelo, mm -hmm. who was mentioned before as the dramaturge for the film, is watching. So. Hey! Hey, Shani! Hi, Hi Shani! <laughs> Can you guys hear me? Hi! I agree. I my audio. Thanks for joining us, Shani. Thank you. Um, Shani, I'm so happy to see you all. 
Um, I, I'd love to have um, you address um, things in, in just quickly in terms of Jesse and, and Nikki, and, and, and you were on set, I believe, as well, and just a little bit of, of the process of working with the actors and what you felt like your mission was here. Oh, that's a really interesting question. Well, I mean, when um, uh, Jeff and Freha and Michael first asked me to work on it, on the film, um, you know, one of the first things that we talked about was having the first part be theatrical in a certain sense. I mean, and what and what that meant was really fluid and, and transformed a lot, I think, over the course of the conversations and the collaboration. But the idea that, um, you know, as, as people have been saying, that it wasn't going to be strictly naturalistic in the contemporary indie film idiom, like that was really powerful to me and really interesting. Um, and uh, so the idea of bringing a group of theater actors together to work uh, on something that we were sort of imagining as this kind of like hybrid between film and theater, at least that's what I was, that's how I sort of imagined it, was that um, the scene would feel a little bit, I mean, and this is, this is like a funny thing to say because this is usually something that's considered so terrible, but like a little bit like filmed theater <laughs> um, was, was really exciting. Like playing in that space where it felt like a little bit, like a little bit pushed in terms of what was stilted, like a little bit um, more uh, uh, like, like slightly bigger than you usually see in film. Um, that was just a really exciting thing for me to, to think about and, and, and work on. And um, yeah, I, I've worked with uh, uh, Jesse and Nikki and all the actors in, in a variety of um, uh, uh, guises and venues over the years and was like so, so thrilled to be able to bring them together with um, these incredible filmmakers. Can I ask a, a question of, of, of everyone who was present for that first half? I'd love to hear a little bit um, about the experience of making, of the, of the, of the, the, the really long take of the singing. Uh, uh, that, that moment, which is, I think, a gorgeous, gorgeous moment, one of my favorite moments in contemporary cinema, truly. Um, and I'd love to know, is that, was that numerous takes? What was it, you know, like, what, what was there, were there variations? You know, were there moments that sort of were replicated or not replicated over the course of, of, of those takes? How you conceived it and executed it and, and whether you got what you came for or whether it became something else? I can start just because, you know, it's, it's in the script and I can tell you how I visualize it and I can tell you that the way that everyone executed that was like beyond my wildest dreams. When, when, <laughs> when we went back and looked at that footage, I think I cried. I actually took, I took a video of it off the monitor and sent it to my husband. And I said, look at what happened today. I was so moved by it. Um, that was, I mean, in a sense, that was like a Terrence Davies, also a Terrence Davies um, reference point because they, in his movies, people usually stop and sing and they connect and they, they, they commune through song, through, through standards. And so using the Gershwin song was, um, you know, very meaningful to us uh, and, and to me. And so that conceptually is important to me. And then also the only other thing that I remember really, really wanting was Sean, the actor Sean, when the camera would kind of like pull back from him that he'd be seated, perched very specifically at the bar with one hand arched this way over his whiskey glass because I wanted him to look very posed, almost like a statue as the camera moved out. Um, and it was one of those things where like, is this gonna look good is this going to be too arched too stilted but it, and Ashley did it so beautifully and the lighting was so beautiful and the actors were so perfect in the moment that it's just, it was a dream yeah I think we did three or four takes if I remember correctly and we switched lenses I think we had a couple wides and then it really I think it really came to life when Ashley suggested why don't we like why don't we put the telephoto on and get a little closer mm -hmm. and that, that I think was a moment that was really you know, it, it really, it, it, it felt, it felt like we'd imagined it could be. I would love to hear you talk about it, Ashley. I don't think we have it all since we filmed. It's been a while. <laughs> it has been a while. Um, I just remember, I mean, I don't know, there are certain times on set when like, mm, you know, it's so cheesy to call it magic, but magic happens and like all the pieces just fit together and you have every reason to believe that they won't and every reason to believe that all these elements will not line up together. And that was just one of those moments where it was like, you know, I mean, I can talk about like the difficulty technically of doing that shot, but it's a little less interesting. It's just, 
every single thing kind of lined up and when you feel a take that like that and it opens up your chest into like this new portion that you didn't know it's like I think we just all left that scene being like oh yeah we got that one <laughs> like, and what you just said reminded me of of um something that Jody you say that we used in the film where you talk about how like every year when it's um spring again you like aren't sure if the things have come together quite right for the food to grow and like even though you've done it year after year in your life you're still like is it gonna happen <laughs> and it does and it's like kind it's just yeah like a, a, a exciting every time it sound, it's it reminded me of how you talked about that experience mm -hmm. Yeah, and I kind of want to be that person at a Q&A who's just going to make a statement, but <laughs> I feel like when you guys approached me about this, you know, the second half of the film was sort of, you know, the concepts were there, the documentary portion, it was like, conceptually, we want to show where food comes from, where the, all these things come together, but when I saw the film for the first time, I was so deeply moved, and Ben, the editor, did such an incredible job because there is this emotional through line that is so rare to connect between you know, people don't always do narrative and documentary poetically, <laughs> like married. And to me, I just felt like the emotional resonance of both pieces was very present and I was impressed. Yeah, big shout out to Ben. That's really, that because the transition point between the two halves is the emotional heart of the film really. And he, he knocked that out of the park very early. And there's a, so Ben Garcher is the uh, editor of the film. There's a question from the audience about the editing process. Mm -hmm. um, did you try out any other formats and did you work with the same editor in both halves? Of course, Ben was working on both halves, but did you try any other formats? Was that something that you toyed with in the edit? I mean, we, <laughs> Ben's actually here, he's listening in. So hi, Ben, thank you for joining. Uh, <laughs> we would, I think every day when we gathered to edit, um, it just became my thing. I would joke about how in the evening I'd switch the halves, like I'd switch the order, uh -huh. <laughs> but we, we never, we never really entertained it. I mean, it might be fun someday just to, as an experiment, just to kind of cut it and like put it for, put it in the different order and see how it would go. Mm. Uh, yeah, it was always, it was always gonna be this way. And I think the editing was, um, it was really, it was really fun and exciting. I mean, we would do, we would sort of like break into teams. There'd be like usually like four or five of us. And a couple of people would work on one station on one half of the film while the other team was working on the other half of the film. And then at a certain point, we kind of like look at what we'd done and then maybe swap. Then maybe we'd put it together, watch the whole movie. Um, and it felt very, um, it felt kind of not, in, not intense and not pressurized the way many edit rooms I've been in can feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and without overly fetishizing the necessity of uh, exactly reflecting our personal experience, um, there were ways in which checking back in with how much the film was like following the, the journey that we took was really valuable. And I think the order was one of them. So like, because it was me, we, it's not that we wouldn't switch the order because you can't try it. I mean, we're editing digitally. It's extremely easy to give it a go, but because um, uh, it was meaningful to see it in that way. Like, I, I do think that there's something in, in indelible, um, you know, imprinted on the image from the experience of the people that are making it. And there are ways in which we looked at things on the farm differently because of the experience of making the scripted film. Um, to, I guess so much so that every time Jeff made that joke, even though I knew he was joking, and even though I, our whole process is like, like um yeah let's just try it you know that's i think it's a re that's a really good way to be every time he made that joke i would get like a little bit angry <laughs> I, would, I, would, I would get very angry as a screenwriter i would get very angry because i always pictured it in a very particular way which is that you have an, an emotional arc and you have characters the characters have to disappear the characters have to disappear that's yeah. the point of the film in a way and so many people have said to me and this is a tribute to jesse and nikki and the cast so many people have said, I really, really missed them when they were gone, and I really wanted them to come back. I've heard that a lot. We hear that at Q&As a lot, because you know, you've heard, yes. that, heard that from friends, I've heard that from random, about instant, even in reviews. So the idea that you lose, that you become emotionally attached, hopefully you become emotionally attached to characters, then you lose them. They kind of evaporate into the ether. Um, they go into, the, they, they're, they're like dispersed almost like, you know, you know uh, milkweed pods as you go to this like natural state, um, this farm. 
that's kind of the point. So, um, you know, the, the scripted part has a resolution of a sort, which is that you have this character who's brought to the dinner. He, you think he's the asshole. He turns out to be the person who sets the stage for a kind of emotional reconciliation. And that's kind of like the beginning of maybe some sort of um, change, some emotional change. But, but to like end it, end it, end it there, it would have felt like too much of a resolution, right? You have to go to the next space. So, yeah, a good joke, but never, never would have happened. <laughs> In terms of what we see at the end of the first half, that transitions, you don't know, you hadn't shot you know, and I'm curious about this in terms of like what those last images were. And obviously that's a beautiful edit, but I'm also curious whether or not you knew that those shots might function as a transition to the second half. With the shots of the snow? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think it was in the script that, that it was that we would see. It was in the script because, that, of, because, of, because of the dead, because of James Joyce of the dead, we wanted snow. But we, yeah. were, we happened, so we rented an Airbnb for a few days and we shot sort of at the beginning of that period um, and we shot a little bit at the end of that period, and I happened to be staying in the Airbnb one night, and it snowed. I remember you, you ran outside, you're like, it's snowing, it's snowing, run out, you ran outside with the camera. But the other shots in that sequence, so it's, yeah, it's actually, it's a funny mix, because that one shot, we just, it was scripted, and of course, it's a thing that you, who, who's to say that we could have gotten that, and it just happened, and then the rest, we sort of played with how it felt, so like, we never experimented with the format in terms of like, do we swap the, the, the halves, but we, there were other ways to play, and which needed play to like, make the halves speak to each other properly, and I do think that section is like, again, like, th thanks to Ben Garchar, because it, because, um, you know, in the same way that we found, found ways to surprise each other. I think Ben often found ways to surprise us and, and what he would come back with and see in terms of, um, th things that made sense ac across those pieces. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it, it, the sequence of shots, you know, it's partly like when we shot what, but then also like, what's a really gentle way to get to the farm? <laughs> like, what's a, well, what's a way to like, we're in this open space, it's snowing, it, you know, but, but what exactly is right is such a um, instinctive thing then. Like we had to try a, a number of, um, of shots from the farm to see what took us there best. And I think in earlier versions, we did a lot more narrative setup, like exposition, like here's where you are, like right. here's what they do. And it actually took, um, you know, we, something wasn't quite working and we were reminded by an outside source, by uh, Mark Luckenbill, who's another frequent collaborator, um, watched the film and said, why are you restarting? Didn't you just tell me the point of this film is that it works across as one narrative arc? And, and we had to sort of go back and, and think about that. Um, yeah. yeah. I have, there's a great question about the farm that I would love to ask to David's come in. Um, I'd also love to hear just like what's happening on the farm now, but it, um, Colin asks, is the farm biodynamic? And also, do you do maple syrup smiley face? <laughs> <laughs> we do not do maple syrup. Um, <laughs> Bad news first. <laughs> we have friends who do. Um, we aren't certified biodynamic, but we do use biodynamic practices. And what's happening now? Like, what I was just going to say, we're, we're running out of time, and this is a, nine amazing people to get through all of this, and Ben is in the audience, and we don't have time to bring Ben in. Um, but I, I do want to make sure we talk about that, Jeff. I'm sorry for talking over you, but Jody, if you don't mind telling us what's happening with the farm right now, considering what's happening uh, in the world and the challenges that we're all facing, I'm curious what, what, what you're doing and, what you, and, and, and how you're disseminating and distributing what you're growing. Thank you. Um, yeah, we're working. Um, the, everyone on the team is back on the farm um, and we're really grateful for everyone showing up every day and, you know, being really cautious and mindful of the precautions we need to take of staying apart from each other, wearing our masks, you know, washing our hands all the time, you know, making sure we're, you know, we're cleaning all the surfaces, you know, following all those protocols that feel, especially I think the distancing thing feels the hardest thing because um, it's, it's like a team sport really. And so just remind, like, we can't help each other always when we would, like, we were like, oh, sorry, like, it just doesn't feel safe to help you right now. And that feels really weird. And that was the thing watching the film, like, I was like, wow, look how close we used to be able to work together. So, it, mm -hmm. you know, even in the short time of being apart, it, it was, it's kind of a shock to not be able to do that. Um, but if that's how we stay healthy, then that's the most important part. 
And yeah, you know, we've sold all of our CSA shares for the season, which hasn't happened in a long time. So our community has really stepped up to support us. And we, and we also have an amazing team of volunteers on the ground who will be making sure the shares get to our members who are all on board and you know, ready to do it, which is really great. So we're really, really grateful right now for all of that support. Mm -hmm. That's great. And, and if you don't mind, I'm just gonna keep going. So Nikki and, and, and Jesse, do you mind talking a little bit about the challenges you're facing right now in terms of uh, performing? Mm. Um, I, I'm lucky enough that the, the show that I was a part of uh, has been highly successful. Um, I'll say Hades Town, um, and and thankfully it's more of a furlough for us right now. So, uh, all that being said, it's still a major blow, and my sense of self is very tied into what I do, um, and so navigating that has been interesting. But everyone's still healthy, and and similarly, like if we got to do this to to make sure everyone stays that way, that's the most important. So. You know, it's it's a different learning curve than I ever expected, but food has come into it way more. I've been cooking all the time. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, I think for me, it's been a really nice time to go in. I really cherish some of this time that I can be just, um, you know, more generative. And, uh, you know, some like workshops and stuff have been put off and I'm okay with that. I'm also in school for um, for dance movement therapy. So I just, I'm doing so much reading and I feel creative in that way. So it's been a really gentle and lovely time for me. And I'm gonna put you, except what, let's just keep going. So Ashley and Caitlin, can you talk a little bit about like how that's been going for you as well? I mean, the, you, the two of you are you're the two of the busiest people that I know. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm imagining like it's maybe dialed down a little bit, which may mean not the worst thing, but also very fraught, I'm sure, too, in terms of, of, of how to do your work. Um, yeah, I was on a film in England that shut down two weeks in, so nobody knows when we start up again. I have a film lined up this summer, but nobody knows when that happens. Um, I'm making a film. <laughs> My, uh, for the first time in quite a long time. So uh, a filmmaker asked a bunch of DPs if they'd make quarantine films. Uh, so it's been nice to kind of adventure back into, uh, I don't know, my own creative space. Uh, and yeah, I don't know. It's a weird time. I did a Zoom, or I did a commercial on Zoom last week. Uh, which Zoom can do things that I had no idea. It's very impressive for <laughs> platform. Um, but yeah, I think we're all just trying to make a way through. And for filmmakers, it's such, you know, we're freelancers, we're actually really outfitted for this. And so I feel like I actually feel a lot less anxiety because I go in and out of work all the time. But I think the predominant thing that I've been talking about with my friends is just like, how do we keep film culture going forward? And how do we keep our institutions around? Because just moving to like streaming isn't actually functioning in a way that promotes what we love about film, which in part is like the culture of going to movies and seeing friends. So thinking about things like that. Yeah. Yeah, going off that a little bit, my um, 10 to six job is at Tribeca Film Institute and I'm advising around 35 short filmmakers on the distribution and festival landscape in a time where that's changing every five minutes. So stuff like this is actually really heartening. Um, it's really, I have two other movies coming out this month in this space and it's really exciting to sort of pilot it and see what it feels like as opposed to the other movies um, and see if it is something where there are, are more people who are around and it becomes more accessible because it's not the same as getting people in. That, that said, I also had a feature I was gonna shoot on March 26 for the next three months and I'm not. Um, but I love being a part of this conversation and seeing the new spaces where our community uh, is sustaining itself and um, is really coming together. And uh, it's really heartening to be able to talk to all of the filmmakers that are under my wing in that space to be like, no, it's, it's not the end of the world. Um, it's just a different world we're in right now and for who knows how long, but you can still have smart people see your movie um, 
and share your feelings. Um, uh, Michael, uh, Jeff, and Freeha, uh, I'm going to leave you off of this question at the moment because we get to uh, revisit with you uh, every Friday now. At least we've begun the reverse shot happy hour on Fridays at 5. Everyone should join them uh, and us for that. And maybe you can go into a little more detail of what you've been working with uh, as we go week to week. Um, but I want to thank all of you for being with us on a Sunday evening like this. This is uh, inadequate, as always, um, inadequate to not be together with the people you love and the people you care about, people respect, and to be in a room with a film and to be in a room with filmmakers presenting a film. There's no replacing that. But I do think that there's something really wonderful about being able to do this when we can. And I hope you all can see Feast of the Epiphany um, during its run uh, at the museum. Um, it's going to be playing for uh, another uh, like I, you know, we have the two more weekends, really. Um, so almost two, two full weeks left where you can watch it that way. Um, I hope you do. Again, thanks so much. Thank you, Shani, for, for showing up, um, <laughs> uh, for, for allowing your voice to, to enter into the space unplanned. Um, and again, thank you so much, everybody, for being here.